Okie dokie. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Jack Throffle Show Monaco series brought to you by sports.com. I'm joined by a returning guest to the show, F1 photography legend, Mr. Jamie Price. Welcome to the boat, Jamie. Thanks for having me. It's good to, good to be back. This is cool. Pretty awesome, right? We're right here in the heart of the harbor, and we're going to talk all things about the Monaco Grand Prix. How have you found it so far? I love this race. It's it's one of my favorites on the calendar. It's not everybody's favorite, um, but I've always really enjoyed it. And I just, more than any other track, it pushes the drivers to do things that they don't have to do anywhere else. And I, I think that there is something to be said for that. Even if the racing isn't amazing, the, they have to be millimeter perfect every single lap for the entire Grand Prix. And uh, I think it's really special. Do you think it was ever true that it was going to get taken off the calendar or was that a negotiation tactic? I think it was a negotiation tactic. They, they have actually changed the management of who runs the, the sponsorship and the TV hmm. broadcast. So until now, the, the TV broadcast used to be run by the Monegasque um, TV network. Sure. And now it's run by Formula One management who do all of the races. So in theory, you should have better TV broadcast coverage where I know there's been like complaints about that in the past. Um, yeah, of course, the famous Lance Stroll moment, I think is what sticks out. It, exactly. So I think that, I think it will improve just on that note alone, but we'll see. I mean, they've made some other small changes, but I love this race. I don't think it was ever going anywhere. And I think it, it deserves to be on the Formula One calendar. And do you think we can look past Max Verstappen for a win on Sunday? Absolutely. I think anybody, that's the, that's the wonderful thing about Monaco is a car that doesn't necessarily have power can still win the Monaco race. Like I've shot this race, I think six times. And in my six times that I've shot it, I think there's been four or five different winners. There might be one repeat winner. I think sure. Lewis is the only repeat winner that I've shot out of those six. And that's not true for any other race that I've shot. So, you know, I, it does it does throw up some interesting results occasionally. Um, and, you know, you, you never know. Like, I, I would love to see Alonzo win. Yeah. I would love to see Charles win. Um, I think a hometown winner would be cool. Yeah, anybody that's never won it before, I think would be an amazing, you know, it's always fun to see the true genuine reaction that yeah. drivers have. Absolutely, and we had some weather come in earlier. At a race like this, what kind of challenges do uh, heavy rain bring in for a photographer? How does that affect your day? Monaco is one of those places that you want it to be bright and sunny like it is right now, even though it was raining earlier, you want it to be bright and sunny or, or pissing rain yeah. and nothing in between. Like if it's cloudy, it's not much fun to shoot. It's it just for whatever reason, it doesn't have as much color and it just kind of goes gray. But when it is raining, I really enjoyed the I've, sh I've shot a couple of Monaco races that are wet and I really enjoy it because you can the, the line changes that they take. Um, there's big rooster tails coming off the cars. It's it's just really cool. I love shooting racing in the rain anyway. So when it does rain, you just as long as you have a trash bag and you can cover up your lenses. Like last year, I didn't think it was going to start raining during the race. I just thought it was going to be, you know, gray and cloudy. And I always have a trash bag in my belt bag. So I happen to have a trash bag, um, two trash bags actually. So one I put over me as a poncho, and then the other one I just wrapped my camera and, Perfect. you know, it, it worked, it, it did the job. And as we've seen F1 grow and grow over the years, the teams have invested more in independent content on their side that they can push out through social media. How have you seen that change the environment and paddock photographers are there more than ever at the moment? There are more photographers. It's It hasn't really changed the number of editorial photographers, but it has changed the, the number of photographers that you just have in, in general running around the paddock. There's at least one or two, sometimes four, different media content people for each team. Sure. Um, generally almost one per driver, like a photographer and a videographer per driver. So it does it does definitely add people in the paddock, but what they don't have access to is they don't have access to track side. So right. for whatever reason, FOM doesn't allow them to go track side. They're limited to being in the garage and um, working in the paddock, but they don't basically leave the garage and paddock area and they don't go out to the areas where you know we are as as you know right so you're independent you're not with a single team right i'm with an agency that works for three of the teams a couple different commercial clients okay and then i'm also working for one of the formula three drivers this weekend can you tell us who that is uh sebastian montoya 
Oh, excellent. So I think we actually might have Juan Pablo as a guest uh, on the oh, boat sometime. Tell, this tell, him, tell him I say hi. Absolutely. He's had a great start, right, Sebastian? Yeah, he's looking strong. I've, I've actually worked with Seb for a while. Um, and I knew because he ran in the IMSA WeatherTech series that I cover cool. regularly. So he was in the LMP2 car with Dragon Speed. So I got to know him. And then he also did his first test in a Formula One car in a Ferrari, even though he's a Red Bull athlete. Cool. Red Bull gave him special uh, compensation to go test a Formula One car from 2008 at the Ferrari Mondiale event last That's year. That's a big sign of trust, right? From Red it is a big sign. It is a big sign of trust. So I had to, sh I had to shoot Seb doing this test um and i had to shoot it in a way that it's a red car but there weren't allowed to be any ferrari logos on it mm. so it was kind of interesting how i how we had to like play it but it was really cool and getting to know sab he's he's definitely a, a future talent absolutely and you mentioned the insect weather tech championship do you feel that that's one of the best series especially for american fans who have got into motorsport maybe through the netflix show what a series they have with the different classes and the quality of drivers and the tracks that we see in the IMSA series. It's, it is unrivaled racing in the motorsport world. Mm. Like I, as much as I love Formula One, it's not known for its amazing racing. It's, it's known for the technology, but it's not known for the amazing racing. Yeah. Whereas sports cars, because they have the balance of performance system, BOP, it, it truly levels the playing field so that in theory, all the cars finish the race at the exact same time. And what you get is is like small differences in how the pit crew operates and how the driver's talent um, weighs from car to car and driver to driver. So, you know, we're really lucky just in the U.S. but also in the world with World Endurance Championship to have to have cars and series at you know iconic world class racetracks that sure. challenge the cars, challenge the drivers. There's no runoff. There's sand and gravel and dirt and grass and whatever else, but. It's amazing racing. The access for the fans is great. You can walk right into the paddock. You can sure. introduce yourself to drivers. I mean, I was at Laguna Seca two weeks ago and Juan Pablo Montoya signing autographs in the in the paddock for anybody that has a ticket. So, awesome. you know, it is really cool. And it's also so critical for the development, right? As a young driver in that IMSA series, you never get a second off. Even if you're in a backmarker car, you're letting the faster cars go past every lap. And do you think that really is a kind of a gap for IMSA to fill, right? Because the fields are so large, it can play such a critical role in the young drivers that maybe can't get into Formula 3 or Formula 2 from a cost perspective. Well, the cost the cost of running IMSA is so much lower. Mm. Just just even running a, an F3 program is millions of dollars. And so running an, you could run an entire season, an entire car of IMSA WeatherTech for less than half of that. And so it is really amazing that you do have these young drivers that um, there's some guys that you'll eventually see in the in the Porsche hypercar program. Um, guys like Sebastian Montoya, who, you know, he was good in open wheel. And then he did a he's done a full season of IMSA WeatherTech um, endurance races that we have with his dad as a co-driver. So he definitely has the track time. And that's the most important thing for these young drivers isn't isn't like necessarily wheeling it around Monaco. It's just track time. Absolutely. And let's talk about gear for a second. It's hugely important for, from a photographer. It's a bit like being a driver, right? You're only as good as your gear. What do you bring to a Formula One race at the moment? What, what's critical to you? Um, well, it, it really doesn't change a whole lot between the races that I shoot, whether I'm doing IndyCar, NASCAR, IMSA WeatherTech or Formula One. Um, this weekend, I have a 400 millimeter lens. I have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. I have a uh, 35 millimeter, a 24 millimeter, and a, a 14 to 24, which is really wide angle. Like you, when I'm, I'm hopefully gonna go up in one of the apartment buildings way up there tomorrow right. for practice three, or I guess Saturday morning for practice three. And it's an amazing view of the whole Harbor and you can see all the boats and yachts mm -hmm. and the cars and almost half the track essentially. But to get all of that in one picture is really hard unless you have a wide Absolutely. angle in. And I don't use a wide angle for every track. like. You know, there's places like Sebring, which is flat and there's no elevation to it. There's really no need for a wide angle lens, um, but places like Monaco where you can get really high, it does make a huge difference. Well, we'll have to keep our eye out for our boat then in your wide angle shot. It'll, it'll definitely be there. We also have the Indy 500 coming up, coming up on the same day. 
as the Monaco Grand Prix. That's an event that you've worked at as well. Yep. Do you feel like they're also kind of taking part in this golden age of motorsport? The racing feels like it's better than ever in IndyCar and the field strength with the international transfers like Grosjean, like McLaughlin, really just growing every year, right? It is really amazing. Like IndyCar is so underrated as a sport and as a as a motor sport. And it's not trying to compete with Formula One. It's totally different. The cars are different. The drivers are different. The tracks are different. Everything about it is different but it can still be really interesting as a as a sport. And it is in a golden age where you still have, you know, iconic drivers like Scott Dixon. Yep. And um, is Juan Pablo running Indy, Indy 500 this year? I don't think I he is. Tony he did, Kanan coming. Yeah, right? Tony Kanan's running, but I know maybe Juan Pablo did last year, but he's yeah. done it. I mean, he's won it twice and mm. you know, run it multiple times. Um, but you still have these legends of IndyCar and you also have the up and coming drivers you have Scott McLaughlin, who's a supercars legend, and it's just, you know, a Catherine Legg, a female driver running in it. She's doing really well, and I've known her for a long time. So it is amazing to have such a diverse field and really close. Like, that's the beauty of the 500 is anybody can win it. If you, if you play your cards right, you play the fuel strategy right, uh, you get a little bit of luck on your side, anybody can win it. Absolutely. And an event like the Indy 500, maybe from an outsider's perspective to a photographer, would be boring, right? Like, it's just an oval. How do you make that interesting on camera? Uh, nothing about the cars doing 230 miles an hour is boring. It is really, I don't say scary very often, but it's scary to stand trackside because sure. when something does happen, there, you know, you're standing at ground zero for essentially a, a carbon fiber explosion. Yeah. Um, no but small crashes. No, there's no small crashes at Indy. And so when you're out there and, and you're able to feel that energy and feel the speed and hear the cars and feel the wind as it just like whips by you, you know, it's very electric. But to cover it, it does go very fast. It's not, it, it just, because the track is so big, to walk from corner to corner, it takes 30 minutes. Whereas sure. here, you know, you can walk almost the entire track in 30 minutes. Whereas you know, Indy, it takes 30 minutes to walk from the first turn to the last turn if you wanted to go shoot them coming around the last turn. So it's just a totally different way of shooting. Um, yeah, it's, it, you just, you try and make the best out of it, um, but also knowing that a lot of your pictures aren't necessarily gonna come from the race day. It's a lot of it's from carb day and practice days and qualifying stuff. It's, it's kind of a whole week mentality versus like, two days of, of action like yeah. we do in Formula One. And there's something special about that fanfare, right? With the, with the huge attendance that they can get at that oval circuit with the grandstands all the way around the track and the fanfares and the anthem, right? Maybe did we see F1 get that a little wrong in Miami when they tried to pick off of some of that energy? You were there, right? Yeah, I was there and it, it didn't feel, I don't know, It there's one side of me is like, I'm, I appreciated that they tried to do something different. Mm. Um, it maybe wasn't, exactly where it could have been but they're small changes i think f1 does need to do more of a show on the driver intro side and not right. just you know make it like cars go to the grid and all right climb out here's some celebrities like it, i love nascar and indycar and imsa weathertech where we do driver intros and it's you know there's smoke and there's fire and you, you kind of make a little bit of a show out of it but it doesn't have to be like trying to compete with those you can do something i don't know what it would be but you know, fortunately that's not my job to figure out, but I, I didn't hate it, but also I didn't get to see it on TV the way the the fans did. Um, and people but I, are quite sensitive, right? You've, they are very you've sensitive. experienced this as growing kind of more of a social media element to your role, posting more. How do you avoid letting those comments get to your heads? Or I, you... I just don't care. I, okay. They can say whatever they want because I know that I've experienced all sides of racing. Um, and there's something to be said positively and negatively about all sides of racing. No series is perfect. Everything that they do, you can improve in some way. Um, but yeah, just like, for example, when they did the, the US Grand Prix in Austin intros in what, 2017 or 2018, where they had the famous WWE, um, all right. let's get ready to rumble. Like Steve Buffer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, I thought that was cool. Everybody else hated it. <laughs> the TV fans hated it. But when you were standing there in the, in the crowd and you're standing there like next to the catch fence, mm. shooting it, it felt like there was way more energy uh, to it than maybe it came across on TV. So maybe partly it's just how they do the TV direction for it. 
you know, if they did it like the Super Bowl intros, I don't, it could it could be cool. But ultimately, you also have to get the drivers on board. And if the drivers aren't on board, like they were slightly negative about Miami, mm. there's not a lot anybody can do if they uh, if they don't play ball too. For sure. And so you mentioned Cota, we mentioned Miami. We're also going to Vegas later this year. Yep. How are you anticipating that for a first time viewer? You've got to capture that, right? That's going to be a pretty spectacular one. I, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go to Vegas this oh, year. Sorry be, for bringing be, it up. Be, yeah, um, no, it's a good problem to have. It's definitely first world problems for me because I'll be in Vallelunga, Italy with Lamborghini. Wow. So I have to choose between my one of my biggest clients, Lamborghini, and working the Formula One race. Mm. So unfortunately, I'm not going, but I do have experience with any F f1 race and first time f1 race it's all just a complete unknown i mean it, there's going to be there's going to be growing pains i think hopefully it doesn't put on a terrible race sure. but at the same time there's lots of i've seen some horrifically boring canadian grand prix before we've seen some horrifically boring monaco grand prix we've some we've seen horrifically boring silverstone grand prix so you know, it, it's just be, if it doesn't live up to the hype, that doesn't mean we can write it off entirely. Appreciate it for what it is. Appreciate it for being something new and different. And I think racing in Las Vegas is absolutely something that they need to do, have wanted to do, and to do it better than they did in the 80s in a parking lot. Mm. I think do it on the strip is the right place to do it. So we'll see. I think they might even be outranking Monaco in terms of ticket prices, right? The audience that they want to bring to that is almost to recreate the atmosphere that we have there down the strip. Yep, I, I can totally see it. You know, Monaco has an interesting place in, in Formula One history, but I think it needs to refine where it belongs in Formula One now, because now you have, I mean, the Miami grid was probably busier with celebrities than I've ever seen the Monaco okay. grid. And I'm sure Vegas will even be on a level above that. So I don't really know what what where all these these races are meant to fit in with each other. And, you know, they're all going to try and outdo each other. Um, we'll see. I don't know. So the people at sports.com wanted me to ask a bit more of a conceptual question okay. and talk about now you've spent your life in the sports media industry. Uh, growing up, what did sports mean to you and when did you decide that it was going to be your life's passion? Uh, sport was really early for me. I was a competitive swimmer from middle school, high school, college. Um, I was a horse racing jockey from high school and college and after college. So, you know, competitive sports have always been something that I've really gravitated to just because, you know, you in real sports, you're not handing out participation trophies for for people that aren't essentially first, second or third. Like you do have to earn, you have to work your way to the top. You have to work hard to to make, you know, to be successful. And I've I've always gravitated just toward that mentality, but also with car racing, you know, if you're if you're second, you're the first of the losers and nobody's going to remember who placed second in the Indy 500. Nobody's going to remember who was second in the Monaco Grand Prix unless you're Checo Perez in a, you know, Force India kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yep. So there's exceptions to it, but I, I've always appreciated that sports, you know, makes human beings be the best that we can be. And if you're not, then you're then you're a nobody that day. And then it makes you work harder to be somebody the next day. And I think what we see, particularly in Formula One, is even the coolest drivers, you can tell after they finish that race, when they're up on the top step spraying the champagne, that's when the emotion comes out, right? And that's also what makes for those great kind of almost newspaper iconic photographs yep. of yep. the celebrations. My, my favorite is when they when they get out of the car, the, they still got their helmet on and you can feel you can feel the energy in their eyes. If they have their visor open, you can you can see the energy in their eyes. And and in some ways, I hate that NASCAR and IndyCar and some of the other sports car series, they've they've changed it for TV where the, they bring the car into the victory lane and they hold them for a TV commercial break and you lose all that energy. The driver gets to sit there and think about it. and cry a little bit but by the time that they're actually climbing out and they've pulled their helmet off at this point they're putting on like a sponsor hat by the time they actually physically climb out of the car you've uh, you've lost a little bit of that raw genuine emotion and a driver climbing out of the car for a first win or a first podium um is really really special and and it's one of my favorite things in the world to cover and i'm always you know 
uh, on Sunday, the the thing I can hope for the most would be a Fernando Alonso win because he would act like it's his first win. Absolutely. And second to that, somebody that's never won before because somebody that has won before, like a Max Verstappen or, um, you know, a, a, any any Lewis Hamilton, I think Lewis would celebrate pretty hard because he, it's been a while since he's won. But mm. you know, as, apart from those guys, if you if they've won it a couple times, I I feel like the energy level definitely comes down mm. uh, a little bit. And we've seen this week. Oh, drop my pen there. We've seen this weekend uh, some spy photography coming out today of that new Mercedes. Yep. Has that ever been a part of your role to try and pick on anyone else's cars, get a little zoomed in bit? A little bit, but not much. Um, more editorially than anything, you know, as a photographer, we're not just expected to cover the teams that the agency services. It's a sure. whole editorial coverage of the race, of the event. Um, you know, there is, there are dedicated spy photographers that go up and down the pit lane and that is the only thing that they do. Sure. And I find it really interesting on one hand, but also at the same time, horrifically boring. Like it's not interesting photography. I have no interest in, yeah. in pursuing it as a, as a full-time profession, but there are people that do and it's important to the teams. Like it does actually have a genuine performance enhancing j job to, to add to the, the team's success and i think that is cool that photographers can play a part in that mm. but it's i find it really boring and more than anything i'll take pictures of parts and winglets that i find pretty and not necessarily because it's aerodynamically interesting mm. from another team's perspective I, f I just find it pretty and i remember going back to 21 now uh, by the end of that season the barge boards on the red bull were one of the most iconic parts just the level of development yeah. every single angle was accounted for and that yeah. every bit of wind um i wanted to touch on we talked about motorsport in america we have an american driver in formula one this year in logan Sargent. What do you think it would mean to American motorsport if he's able to find his footing with Williams and score some points this year? I, I'm really torn because I really, I love seeing an American back on the grid, but you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, you could take any country. If you have a driver in the car, it loses that, that, that this energy if they aren't performing at a level where it's interesting week in and week out. So if he's not in podium contention or winning races or toward the front end of the field, I don't know that that America cares, which is why I was really disappointed that Colton Herta wasn't given a, a genuine opportunity because I think Colton is a genuine racing talent. He's proven that in IndyCar, even though he's not a champion, he's a race winner. And you don't just get to be a race winner in IndyCar by by chance or by luck, like you do have to earn it. And he, he does have the experience to race against any of these drivers, any, any of these drivers I would put him up against. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, it's hard because I, on the one hand, I wanna feel excited about it. But on the other hand, I know as an American, knowing Americans and knowing how the media works and how the, just our society and culture is like, if you're not winning, you know, why do we want to pull for the team that's in, you know, 12th place unless it's your, you know, your hometown team? And it just doesn't really work that, that well. It's not a direct comparison with motorsport. So I'd love to see him do well, but ultimately if he just stays at Williams and, and gets a couple points, but never really climbs the ladder to somewhere better, somewhere different, something that has the opportunity to help push his career to places where he's going to actually be a known quantity in the U.S. Mm. I don't know that it'll ever take off. Well, we'll be all watching on Sunday to find out. And maybe if he can put in a good qualifying lap, this could be that chance of points. But I think that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for watching and check back in the rest of the week for more interviews with sports.com.